But yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued just by uh, um, and how much you know, that 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 you know the, the taxi driver hippocampus thing that always right. gets talked about, and you think, exactly. well, what part of the frontal lobe, etc., when you exercise it every single night. And right. why you deliberately, because I mean, some comics are much more, I mean, it'd be interested to know the difference in, say, comics who are more comfortable doing the same routine every single night. Some people, once they've got their hour or their 20 minutes, they stick to that. Okay. And there's very little deviation. Other comics are always wanting to change it every hmm. single night. And always looking for the new way so they don't bore themselves. And maybe there's someone in the audience who may have seen it before, so you'd never want to create the same show. And how that changes in terms of structure and sure. activity. Yeah. No, it's actually interesting because we didn't think to specifically look for structure. We never expected we'd get enough uh, professional comedians, frankly. But the reality is that it's possible now, depending on how many people come. And we have an enormous collection of, of college-aged, normal, non-comedians, you know, um, to compare it against. And those structural studies, like the taxi driver study that you mentioned, typically you take, you know, a set of taxi drivers and then you compare them to a fairly large sample of the rest of the population, four or five hundred people. We have on the order of 6,000 scans at this point from this scanner. So we could easily look for structural changes um, in addition. It wasn't something that we had really thought about to begin with. But the reality is, you're right, we have the data. There's no reason why we don't look. Right. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, it would be great to see the brain muscle that's being uh, worked hard by your creativity. And as I said, um, I can show you more of this if you'd like. And also, we'll send, you, um, we'll send it to you electronically along with um, yeah. a free piece of software for viewing it. And you can then look around and you know, yeah, play no, with I'd it. Yeah, I'd love to do that. that you that'd get it, great. the whole thing in 3D. It's always, I mean, there's always fun bits. I always enjoy the fact that you can see the lenses of the eyes yeah, so well. Yeah. But I don't know if you can see it as well, but right on the back here, there's a thin gray line. That's your retina. So you know how when you go to the eye doctors and they take the picture mm -hmm. of your retina? This is, you know, it's, it ends up being this big on the screen, but of course this is this tiny little thing. And this is your optic nerve coming in. And if we stick looking at this one, you can see the optic nerve comes together, it runs together in like a little X and then half of the visual field shoots off to one side of your brain, half shoots off to the other. That's always something that shows up incredibly clearly in these scans. So I love all that stuff about, you know, the, uh, some people say, well, the left hemisphere, that's where, you know, if you want to say where your soul is, and I've right. enormous inverted commas around that, yeah. that's in the left hemisphere. And then I've talked to other people who go, well, even though the right hemisphere doesn't seem to be communicating, and this seems to be where our conscious, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued by all those experiments, the, the Roger Sperry stuff and all right. those things. Right, right, split brain patients are amazing. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, I fall pretty thoroughly on the atheist side of things, so I'd say your soul is in church. But um, I suppose what they mean, where the, the kind of the unis of you is, is in the left, you know, some, yes. some documents I've read, they really go with the left hemisphere. That's where you are. The right, right. hemisphere is doing a lot of stuff and it's being, you know, an, an obviously very active part of, right. of, of the brain, but you, I, and, I, and then other people go, well, the no. trouble is, it's like those, when they do those karma like nun experiments where yeah. they, they stuck them in an MRI and they had yeah. to think of the most gaudy thing that they, you know, yeah. all that Yeah, stuff. right, absolutely. And like, we're going to find the god spot. Oh, shit shit, there's loads of different bits here, and this is... <laughs> it's not so, yeah, tricky. The other thing that comes up is you mentioned occipital lobe, right? So there are these patients who have damage to the occipital lobe who lose the conscious ability to see, but they can still see. Have you run across these? Uh, blind sight stuff. Brilliant, yeah. That is, but that's what gets that's me mind blowing. which is to go, how, you know, do we even need to be self-conscious? Right. Do we, and, and one of, it's one of the hardest ideas, isn't it, to go that the idea that the, because I suppose blind sight, what we're seeing there is, that, so that's, part of the brain that evolved before self-consciousness. We, we, or we've seen the equivalent. Right, how you know, do you know, right? This is, you know, that idea of not being aware, of having no right. idea right. that you are, and of course I suppose this is going on all the time anyway in our brain. There's sure. loads of stuff going on. All the time. But that, who was the first person who was dealing with the blind side? Larry Weiskrantz at Oxford is the guy who's famous for it. And the hysterical part, I was at Oxford for a few years, and some, some of my colleagues there were there as graduate students when Larry was doing it, and they, they were very funny about the whole thing. They said, we all knew he was nuts, right? Um, he was so obviously wrong that it was kind of sad. And for 10 years, Larry had trouble getting it even published. And by the end of those 10 years, he had accumulated so much data that he wrote a book that completely changed everybody's thinking. And my colleague, who's now one of the fellows of the Royal Society, said, you know, it was, it was superb because it made me realize you don't know. 
the reason that you do the science is you don't know. You've got to actually check. But you're right. I mean, for years and years, people just thought Larry was cracked. Um, when, in fact, he was just brilliant and saw something that the rest of us weren't seeing. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's the horror, isn't it? I was thinking about the Liber experiments when I was in there as well. You know, yeah. Will we discover that there's no free will in the, the stuff that I'm saying? And then, yeah. and then you do get caught up with going, well, you're not conscious of what a lot of the time, apart from when you're doing an anecdote you've done lots of times before, right. As each word comes out, you have there is no sense of conscious thought that's led to that sentence. It is just the barrage right. and the structure that occurs and all of that. And then you sometimes stop and think, right. I have no idea where that... Like that moment where you might... You know, I don't normally laugh at what I say on stage. I'm not that kind of comic. But every now and again, an idea comes out and you had no idea that... Re and it's a really good one. You think you've really taken yourself by surprise. And every yeah. now and again, something comes out. I think no idea where that comes from. That sometimes as I like lying in there, at times I was thinking, ah, I, I I noticed that a lot of the springboards into the ideas are things that I've read recently or that it's experience or you're picking what is been hovering around for mm -hmm. a while and then some things seem to come from nowhere and then sometimes you sort of think, what would Freud make of some of these associations? Right. If you're only on a sofa. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> No, I, th it's, I think it's true. I think if you start thinking about the mechanics of which word comes next, you immediately lose all sense of fluency, right? You know, and I think that that's true for sports peoples and musicians and all. They don't think about how to, you know, hit this tennis shot. Andy Murray isn't thinking, I need to switch my grip here. Yeah. And, you know, musicians aren't thinking third, fourth, you know, it just doesn't happen. It, part of that fluency is how much you sub sublimate all of those processes and you're really focusing on the creativity and the interaction with your audience. Um, is this being received well? Am I on a track that's working? Am I happy with this track? Is this going to lead me to some place where I'm going to be completely stuffed and I have nowhere to go from there? You're thinking at a totally different plane. You're not worried about the way you sell out the words and how they come out that much because you know that the audience is going to be incredibly forgiving with that. It's only when you're forced into a just the minute kind of situation where you also have to do an incredible amount of self-monitoring to avoid all the normal things like repetition or any kind of hesitation that you would normally be totally acceptable in speech. Because there is a moment, where, like with me, I find that when I do the actual show, the tripping over moment is I am aware a tiny moment before that word comes out that I've fucked up. Yeah. And I'm aware though, too late to stop it, it's forming, it's coming out, I'm trying to, ah, and you know, and that normally yeah. will happen. I, I sometimes, before I've even done the repetition, in fact, I've, it, ah, bah, yeah, right. hesitation it becomes, because. Of course, because you know, you've seen that that's what's going to happen, and even before the rest of the people on the panel can hear it, right, or Nicholas Parsons or anybody, right, you're just, you know, it's just about to come out of your mouth. And I think that's one of the interesting things about the LeBay kind of experiments, is this sense of, um, you know, free will, well, you do have this internal monitoring of things that are happening before they've really happened. And that's, of course, because they're being planned in your brain before you actually produce them, right? It takes 400 milliseconds or whatever it is to, to get these things out into the world, but you know about it, this, you know, before you've actually bothered to, to program the motor muscles to actually do it, because it's part of being fluent. You have to know in order to speak clearly. So, um, it's, it's just a fascinating topic. And I think that, for me, one of the reasons I'm excited about this project versus a lot of the other things that people do in the field is we often focus on what goes wrong. Somebody who's got a stroke or somebody who's got Alzheimer's or kids with dyslexia. And that's super valuable and I think it's important. We very, very rarely focus on what's right. In people who do a particularly good job in things, that level of expertise, be it creativity or fluency or whatnot, particularly in an area that we can all do, right? So, I'm not a good tennis player. I'm never going to play like Andy Murray. I don't really need to. Uh, that's not that interesting to me. But I've been speaking my whole life, and I consider myself not bad at it. But nonetheless, I still have friends um, who are considerably more fluent than I am, and I can go to comedy shows or listen to the radio and think, wow, it's impressive that a person is able to deliver that at that level, and I wish I could do that. You know, so I consider myself an expert speaker, but I recognize that there's a whole level well beyond what I can do. And I think that that's the kind of thing that may help appeal to an audience in this case, because they're going to be able to recognize it. I think it's, I mean, I find it's because the advantages that allow me to do what I do are also all the reasons that for, I can't do sport, I can't dance, yeah. because I'm very self-aware, I'm yeah. very self-conscious, but I'm not so self-conscious that I can't just blether on right. and go, ah, I, can, I, I can do words, 
Yeah. And I can do pratfalls, but I can't do uh, sport. I was always terrible at throwing a ball. I'm constantly wet. I can feel my whole arm all the time. Right. Vroom. Right. All the things Dancing. you shouldn't. I'm right. I'm aware of my legs. I'm aware of my legs. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always aware of what I'm doing with my face when I'm dancing. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a shame. That's brilliant, by the way. That's fantastic. Well,